All right. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I know we're tired. I'm very sleepy. So, if I don't put myself to sleep, I will make sure I'll try my best not to put you guys to sleep. So, I don't have a PowerPoint. This isn't going to be very, like, free spirited talk. That's, that's, that's my style. style. The PowerPoint style is not. I, 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 like, like, I, like, I hold the Bible to talk to people that actually are holding Bibles with their, themselves, but it's okay. <laughs> it's the Midwest, right? <laughs> it's the Midwest. <laughs> Sorry, streaming people. Just kidding. Just joking. God bless the Midwest. <laughs> One day the printed Bible will make it out here. <laughs> but you know what? I heard something really cool. I heard that in the Midwest, when we play games, we bring our Bible. But when we come to the talks... Yeah. What's up with that? Just kidding. All right. I'm just messing around with you. Because I can. Because you can't really say anything to me because I'm the priest. <laughs> All right. What I wanted to talk about and what I've been talking to you guys about and I wanted to go into depth with is, so what do we do? Like, what do we do? How do we break free and how do we... Part of it is God's part and God's part is the wilderness part. God's part to let you, set you free or to break you free is the wilderness part of it. Is that God says, all right, I'm going to do what I need to do to get the crud out of you, right? Those seeds or those earthly appetites or those fleshly appetites that we all have, God is going to do his part with the wilderness, but now we got to know what's our part. <laughs> I'm going to be really loud then. <laughs> They're going to hear the gospel today. Each and every one of us, like I said, we have our hearts. And when you were a child, your, your, your heart was very sensitive, was very delicate. And any attack that the devil used to attack your heart, to plant seeds inside of your heart, made you create this wall around your heart. And we build these walls that kind of makes us colder, less sincere, less open, less vulnerable. But what I'm going to talk about are spiritual walls that we need to build around our heart. Because knowing that our enemy wants to plant things inside of your heart, every day when we pray the Agbeya, we say, build the walls of Jerusalem. What are the walls of Jerusalem? What's Jerusalem? What's Jerusalem? The church. My heart. Okay, very good. Jerusalem is the heart. And every time I'm praying Psalm 50, I'm saying, Lord, build the walls of Jerusalem. Build walls. Around. What did Nehemiah do in the Old Testament? Is that Nehemiah, the people of Israel were captives in Babylon. They were li not living in Israel. They were captives under the Babylonian kings. Babylonian, Assyrian, so on. Okay. And they, Nehemiah heard that the walls of Jerusalem were broken down. Which means what? What's going to happen to Jerusalem if the walls are broken down? Anyone can take it. Anyone can overtake it, destroy it. There's no walls. And so Nehemiah took it upon himself to go to Jerusalem to build the walls around the city. He wanted to build the walls in order to protect the city of Jerusalem. Anybody ever see the movie Troy? Okay. What was the secret of the city of Troy and why they were so powerful and undefeatable. The walls. They had the highest walls ever. So it was a city. Let me get everyone's attention. It was a city on an island. I don't know if it was a city or country or whatever they were. Kingdom. City of Troy. <laughs> Troy, Michigan. Right? <laughs> they were on an island. And any enemy that wanted to fight them would come by boats. They would come in. And the people of Troy would just sit on top of their high walls. And their archers would just shoot at the enemies and destroy the enemies, and there was no way that their enemies could overcome them because they could never penetrate the walls. And so what each and every one of us needs to do is we need to build walls around your heart. And I'm going to ex explain how to build those walls. Well, do you guys know how the city of Troy came down? The Trojan horse. 
the Trojan horse. What happened was, one of the countries that was fighting against Troy, they couldn't win because of the archers, and they were losing the battle. So they said, we're going to retreat. So they decided, we're going to leave. And they left a gift on the beach, and it was, the, it was a big horse, okay? It was this huge, ginormous horse that they built, and they left it on the beach as a gift saying, we just want peace, leave us alone. So the city of Troy celebrated, and they partied all night. They brought the horse inside the walls, and they were celebrating, and they enjoyed. They said, we beat our enemies. Everyone went to sleep, and inside the horse was a ton of soldiers hiding in there, waiting in there all day, so that when everyone fell asleep... <laughs> They broke through the horse, they rampaged the city, they set it on fire, they killed all the people, and, and they took over the city of Troy because they got behind the walls. What I'm going to talk about is how to build spiritual walls around your heart. Why do we pray the Agbeya every day? Why do we pray it first hour, third hour, sixth hour, ninth, eleventh, twelfth, midnight? Why is it that throughout the day we are constantly praying the Agbeya hours? Because, right? We have nothing else to do. So let's read 75 Psalms in a day. What is the purpose that every day the church has given us a tool to, to use every day? What's the purpose of it? And why so often? What do you guys think? There's no right answer. A reminder, okay? A reminder. Very good. Keeping your guard up. What you're doing is you are sanctifying the heart all day long. All day long, you are connecting the heart to God. You are reminding yourself, number one, you're putting yourself in the presence of God throughout the whole day. So that any arrow that the devil wants to fight, fight you with, all day, all mind, you're just fortifying your mind and your heart with walls through the prayers of the Psalms. So we talked about building walls around the heart through, through the Psalms, and it's protecting it from the, any time that, you know, the enemy hates the Psalms. The devil cannot stand the Psalms. Anytime you feel tempted, anytime you just say a Psalm, the devil burns alive. He cannot, he cannot handle the prayers of the Psalms because the Psalms are inspired prayers. They're, they're biblical prayers written by the Holy Spirit, through the hand of David, that God has encouraged us to use back to God. So the first thing is building walls around the heart through the Psalms. It's a spiritual rule. And what the spiritual rule or canon is doing, do you guys know, so the monks have a canon that they have to abide by every day. They have to pray 150 Psalms, or they have to pray the whole Agbeya, or some people go on and they read all 150 Psalms. And they have to do it every day. They cannot go to sleep. A monk is not allowed to go to sleep without f finishing their canon, which is praying all the psalms. And do you know what a monk wears under the galabaya? They wear a belt. Very good. Do you know why a monk will wear his belt? So let's just say the monk is size 34 waist, okay? He's wearing his belt. He's a thin monk, okay? He should be thin. He's a monk, right? He's got a, a size 34 waist. And what happens if he lets it loose at? What do your dads do when after they eat? They loosen the belt, right? They, they got to let the kirsch kind of sit. <laughs> size 34 waist is there. The reason why they tighten it tight, sometimes 34, sometimes they make it even tighter. 33. Why? To give myself no room for relaxation. Why is that? Because I don't want to give myself room to let the devil work in my life. And so every day I know that I ate a little bit too much today. I'm feeling a little snug here in this belt. What do you got to do? They discipline their bodies enough until they find out that, hey, the belt is kind of loose. What do they do when they feel like the belt is loose? Tighten the belt. And that's how they measure their growth. Not just your physical the disciplining of their flesh and that they're losing weight. But there's got to be a way to measure your spiritual growth. Remember, I was talking about the spiritual maturity. You have to get to a point where you say, well, how much capacity can I do now? Maybe I used to pray once a day. 
And for the last 10 years, I've prayed once a day for 30 seconds. As my head is hitting the pillow, I'm saying, Our Father, okay? And before I get to the end, I'm already asleep. And now I need to measure how I can increase my capacity for prayer. Everybody here, I assume, I hope and pray, that we fast Lent, okay, when Lent comes around. And in the beginning of Lent, what's your mentality about food? I need it, right? I hate the fast. This stinks. Somebody get me a burger because I can't handle it in the beginning because you feel like you have no control over your appetite. Or am I the only crazy person? You're like, yeah, you're the only crazy person. Okay, so I'm the only weak person. But basically, when a, start, when a fast is about to start, I psych myself out. This is going to be the most difficult thing. And as soon as first day comes, I look at my watch. I'm like, okay, great. 40, 54 more days to go. We're going to live through this. Two days pass by, and I'm like, we're almost done. <laughs> and every time I think about my stomach, I'm thinking like, so I'll tell you what I used to do when I was younger. This is the old man. This is the old Winnipeg. <laughs> We used to go to, I used to live in California, and the monastery was two hours away. So I used to, <laughs> me and my friend, we'd always go to the monastery like almost every week or every other week. And we, there was always this uh, rest stop. It was like an outlet center, and they had like an in and out on the way, big, shiny. It was always in the fast. And we felt like, you know what, maybe we need to break our fast to feel the need to fast more. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow that in and out sign would just do it to me. And that's the old man, right? There's... We can be freed from bondage. <laughs> and so when you fast, over time, you start to realize that I don't like it. Little by little, I get used to it. I've accepted it. Three f weeks into it, four weeks into it, I'm getting used to the smaller portions. My stomach is shrinking. And if your churches have like late liturgies, like our church has very late liturgies in Lent. So we finish at 6.30 or 7 p.m. So you're fasting from midnight to 7 p.m. You get used to it. And after you finish one of those liturgies, if you ever attended them, they're special, right? They're torturous while you're fasting all day. But when you get out, do you need to pig out? You really just need a cup of water and like two or three bites and you're good. Sometimes you feel like you're, you think you're hungry and you get a big old whatever and you can't finish it because your stomach is shrunk. Because what you've done was you've shrunk your appetite. Your stomach doesn't have room anymore to fill what it used to be filled with. So when it comes to the end of the fast, it's Easter and it's time to enjoy. You're hungry and you look with your eyes and you see the full buffet of lahma, right? And you get excited, but at the end of the day, you take a few bites and you're full. Or you go to five guys and you look at it and you're like, can I really eat something? Like, am I allowed to eat anything? And you're, you're still looking like two weeks into the 50 days, you're thinking, am I allowed to eat things? You know why? Because you've gotten your body into control. You have control over yourself. Now you're thinking twice as to whether you can eat fatari, where before I was thinking twice as to if I'm going to be able to continue eating siami, right? Because I've brought my body into control. I have control over my body now. What that is is that disciplining of the flesh is the need for a spiritual rule. First thing I said, the spiritual rule or canon so the Psalms, I'm not telling you to do what the monks do. I'm going to give us a very simple one. I'm going to give you an equation. It's going to be for our level. First thing is does what? Builds walls around the heart. So that the enemy cannot plant more seeds. How many of us, we go to confession, we confess our sin, and we go back, we come back three weeks later to Abuna, we say, Abuna, the usual. Somebody actually last week told me, Abuna, the usual. Like... <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'll just be sure to keep the list here so I don't, you don't have to remember it anymore. I'll just try to remember everything that you do. <laughs> Abuna the usual. Because what's happening is when we confess, we cut, this, we cut the sin on the surface. But what's the problem? It's like when you have a weed and you cut it at the surface. There's roots. So, Abuna, I fell in the sin of lust. I fell in the sin of, you know, I'm whatever. All these things that I keep on over and over, I'm lying and I'm addicted to lying or I'm addicted to whatever. This bondage that I'm in, there's roots. Remember I was talking about these seeds that were planted in your heart from your childhood. Your parents gave you, like you have a, like mental complexes, okay? Because the whole like good boy, bad boy thing that switches over in 24 hours. These things that 
the devil has used to plant crap inside of you, excuse my French, okay? The only way to get it out is through the spiritual rule, through prostrations, and through denying the self and disciplining the flesh. You are digging, and you are digging up those old roots. We're going to read a passage right now. If you have your Bibles, I hope you do. If you have your phones at least, I'll absolve you today to read, use your phone. Second. Kings chapter 3. Second Kings chapter 3. From verse 15, I'll give you some background so we don't have to read the whole chapter. Basically, the evil king of Israel, he's an evil king, but Elisha the prophet was the prophet in Israel at that time. And so, a couple kings were getting together, and they were going to go to war against other kings who were more powerful than them. And they were afraid and they said, we have no water for our animals. We are, don't know what to do. We're going to die. We're not going to be able to fight this. Maybe God is trying to destroy us. And so they come to Elisha, the prophet, and they're asking him, what should we do? Even though the king of Israel was evil, the king of Judah, so just a small history lesson. Israel was divided into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom, which was Israel, and the southern kingdom was Judah. Okay? The king of Judah was working with the king of Israel together. One was evil, one was good. And Elisha said, because of the good king, King Jehoshaphat, I'm going to go ahead and, and help you out. So verse 15, we're going to read from here. We'll start from 14. And Elisha said, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would not look at you nor see you. But now bring me a musician. Then it happened when the musician played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. Before we continue, imagine Elisha. They're going to kill us. And the countries are getting together. And they're going to kill our people. You need your help us. We need you to pray. What does he say? Uh, Mazika, please. Like, <laughs> like, like, we're about to go to war and you're asking for a musician. What I want you to understand about the musician is that the Holy Spirit used to come. So whenever they would anoint a king, they would have trumpet players and they would, and the Holy Spirit would come upon the people through the music, would come upon the king in the presence of the music, in the presence of, so when you see this music part, it's not just Elisha Izzetzella, like he's actually asking that the Holy Spirit would come. When Saul had a distressed spirit, what would David do? He'd play the harp or he'd play the, the, the instruments before and, and Saul's spirit would be comforted. So I'm encouraging you to bring music next year because <laughs> the singing is wonderful. And like I want to commend you on the singing, but maybe we can have some music next year. Bring me now a musician, verse 15. Then it happened when the, mu music, m when the musician played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. And he said, thus says the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain. Yet that valley shall be filled with water so that you, your cattle, and your animals may drink. And this is a simple matter. In the sight of the Lord, he will also deliver the Moabites into your hand. Also you shall attack every fortified city and every choice city and shall cut down every good tree and stop up every spring of water and ruin every good piece of land with stones. So what they're saying is, we have no water, help us out. So Elisha says, obey me what I'm going to say right now. Make this valley full of ditches. Okay, you're a king, and you have soldiers who are about to go to war, and the instruction is, have all your soldiers go and fill the valley, go dig ditches. What's your response as the king? How do you feel? They're, they're going to... You're the king. Your army is about to go fight. You're asking for water, and he's saying, go fill the valley with, vich with ditches. How are you feeling? What's, what's good or bad about that? What do you guys think? Huh? <laughs> like, can We're going to be dead tired. How are we going to fight a war after we've just dug every hole in the valley? Part of it was he wanted obedience. Second thing is, if you want the water, you need to labor for it. What does water represent in the Bible? Life and baptism. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. 
So he's saying, if you want water, if you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, because when the presence of the Holy Spirit is filling your life, which is the goal of the Orthodox life, whenever you read the Fathers, the goal of the Christian life is not salvation. Salvation is forgiveness of sins. That's not the goal of the Orthodox Christian life. The goal is that we would be filled with the Holy Spirit. Right? Okay, your sins are forgiven. Are you happy? It's not enough. I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so he says, make this valley full of ditches. And then he, what does he say? You shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain, yet that valley shall be filled with water so that your cattle and your animals may drink. He's saying you're not going to see how the water is going to come. Do what I say, dig the, the ditches in the valley, and you're not going to know where the water comes from. It's like I want you to, how many of us, how many of you guys work out? Apparently nobody here. No, okay, <laughs> just kidding. You all look wonderful. <laughs> When you work out, the first day you go, like guys, you wear the cutoff shirt and we all like to feel big. And we go and we say, you know, put on all the plates. And you go and you realize, I can't even carry this. Just leave it to the bar. Okay. You start lifting little by little. And of course, the first thing you do after you work out is what? You flex in front of the mirror, of course. <laughs> and you realize nothing has changed after I just killed myself <laughs> at the gym. You go, you work out. Second day, you look in front of the mirror, no change. Third day, no change. After a month, you got, you got sick of looking in the mirror because you realize there's no change. I'm beating myself up at the gym. After a month or two months, what do you start to see? I'm tone. I'm starting to see a little bit more muscle showing, right? Like you can just imagine what it would look like if somebody worked out for a long time just by looking in front of you. <laughs> I, that wasn't a joke. <laughs> I know black is slimming. Black is slimming, so it's. You don't know. You don't see the muscle. You don't say, okay, after two weeks, I got one inch of muscle. Maybe two more weeks, I'm going to get another inch of muscle. It doesn't work that way. You just commit to what? Doing the labor, and the fruits will come. You can't tell. You can't see that over time, I grew X amount and I lost as much weight. It just happens. You can't see how it happens. And that's the spiritual life. You won't see that, oh, today I did two matanyas, I increased in the spirit this much. It doesn't work that way. But what I do is I commit to the workout. I discipline myself where I tighten the belt and I build myself spiritual muscles through, through the spiritual canon or the spiritual rule. Verse 20. Now it happened in the morning when the grain offering was offered that suddenly water came by way of Edom and the land was filled with water. So what happened? When did the water come? Which is what? Every morning they would offer offerings, right? They offer the offering of incense in the morning. And they offer an offering of incense in the evening. Let's just call them matins and vespers. Okay, do you guys know where they come from now? So <laughs> matins and vespers, it's an offering of incense. It's the sacrifice of incense. And so through their committed prayer, which they did every day, their prayer was that they would do this grain offering. That's when the Holy Spirit came. When does the water come? Through your committed, regular, consistent prayer. One thing I like to talk about in the spiritual is knowing, how many of you guys, you're going to, you guys are at a retreat right now. Maybe some of you guys are motivated spiritually. You're encouraged. You're going to go down the mountain. You're going to go home, and it's going to last for about three days. <laughs> like it happens at every retreat. And then what happens? Sst. Because we have no spiritual canon to ensure that the vessel stays intact. So what happens is everything that you've received here, God is trying to fill you with his Holy Spirit through the word of God and through prayer and quiet time and the Ekbeya and we take communion and we confess and we do all these things at retreat and you're getting filled, 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 filled. And as soon as you go down the mountain, if you have no spiritual canon, it all oozes out. I have no plan and that's what you're going to do, God willing, at the next quiet time. You're going to make a plan and I'm going to give you uh, instructions on maybe how to start. Verse 21, and when all the Moabites heard that the kings had come up to fight against them, all who were able to bear arms and older were gathered and they stood at the border. Then they rose up early in the morning and the sun was shining on the water and the Moabites saw the water on the other side as red as blood. So these are the enemies that saw it as red as blood. 
And they said, This is blood the kings have surely struck swords and have killed one another. Now therefore, Moab, to the spoil. You know what your spiritual rule will do? It messes up the devil. It messes him up. You are destroying the devil that every time he's coming to attack, oh, sorry, this is when I pray my first hour. And as soon as you go to work and somebody's going to annoy you, that same person, you've prayed a psalm as soon as you sat at your desk. And then as soon as you went to lunch and, and the ladies at your office are doing whatever and you feel like you read a psalm. And then as soon as you get back, you read a psalm. So you sanctify your mind and your heart all the day that the psalms are guarding you mind, your mind and your heart all day. You mess up the devil. Now it's no longer on the defense. Now we're on the offense. The Holy Spirit will do things. He'll destroy your enemies in a way that you don't know. He's going to destroy those things. When you put valleys in the ditch, dig ditches in the valley, you're uprooting. You're uprooting the junk that's in there. So he's saying by the spiritual labor that we do, by the fastings, and the committed prayers, even though I don't feel like it, I'm tired, I want to go put my head on the bed and just go to sleep. No, I have to do my spiritual rule. I have to read three psalms today. But I'm dead tired. It's okay. I trust that. What happens if you stop working out? You work out for a week and you don't work out for two weeks. What happens? You don't look right, right? You get fat and it doesn't work, okay? It doesn't work. You have to be disciplined. Or it leaks out. The, the, the Holy Spirit, the grace of the Holy Spirit will leak out of your life. All right. Verse 24, so when they came to the camp of Israel, Israel rose up and attacked the Moabites so that they fled before them and they entered their land, killing the Moabites. Then they destroyed the cities and each man threw a stone on every good piece of land and filled it and they stopped up all the springs of water and cut down all the good trees. The springs of water were the ones that were feeding the other army. What was causing the other army to grow and to get stronger, they were stopping. The enemy is becoming weaker. He has no power in my life. That when the devil sees you, and he sees that you're filled with grace, and he sees that you're filled with the Holy Spirit, and God is dwelling inside of you, for a time he's going to leave you. And he's going to come with new tricks. But if you have your spiritual rule, you're guarded. You have the walls around the heart. You are digging out the old stuff that's been planted that every day consistently. I'm doing my prayers. I'm doing my prostrations and my matanias. What does the matanya do? You know there's a mystery in the matanya. The matanya is not, it's not exercise. Part of it is. Part of it is to tire out the body. When you feel like your hormones are pumping or kicking or whatever they are, a good thing to do is to do prostrations. We all have, we all have our hormones and they all kick in at some point and some time in our lives, in our days, whatever they are. When you do matanias, the first thing is you're tiring out your body. The second thing is a matanya or a prostration is a form of worship. Every day you go down and you worship before Christ. You say, I worship you. I make you my God. You are my God today. Every day when I do matanya, I'm saying, you are my God. The third thing that it does, it's a form of repentance. It's how we maintain the life of repentance by doing matanias and going down and saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. I remind myself, even in the times where you feel good. You see what happens is when you're doing good for a while, you haven't said that lie or you haven't, you know, fallen in the sin that you've fallen in. You feel like I'm good and you let loose. That's when you're done, okay? The humility that you get or that you experience through putting your face to the floor and asking for God's mercy always, it says, even though I feel strong today, I know without your grace, I'm not. I need your grace. So the first thing is, tires out your body. Second thing is, form of worship. Third thing is, repentance. Fourth thing is, it's a form of surrender. Remember how today I was saying, giving over your life to God. I'm bowing before you. I'm saying, my life is yours. Every day when you go, you say, my life is yours. My life is all yours. Today I'm giving you my life. I'm giving you my thought. I'm giving you my heart. I'm giving you my energy. I'm giving you all this stuff. The fifth thing is, it's death and resurrection. I'm saying, I die. Abuna Paul dies. Christ is risen today. Today, forget Abuna Paul today. It's Christ being risen. So it's dying and resurrecting with Christ. There's a mystery taking place in the, in the Matanya. It's sacramental. Okay? You don't know how it comes, but it comes. There's a mystery working in the Matanya. I'm encouraging you to do that. So the first thing is we build walls around our heart. 
Second thing is digging ditches. Dig, this, dig a ton of ditches through the discipline. Third thing is limit your, by tightening the belt, limiting your room for relaxation and letting the devil take advantage of your weakness, of being slothful or of being lazy or of being, so tighten the belt a little bit. Add some discipline to your life. You're expanding your capacity and your appetite for spiritual things. Remember in the earlier in the retreat I was saying the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit what? Lusts against the flesh. You strengthen the spirit, you're weakening the flesh. I promise you. You fill the spirit. Problem is, when I said, what are the lusts of our spirit? We don't know. We don't know. The lusts of your spirit are the presence of God. The spirit longs to be in fellowship with God, longs to be close to God. And so, grow the spirit and starve the flesh. There's a story of, or an example of, an eagle that wants to fly that's tied with a rope. The father has described this as the tied with a rope, okay, to a dog. And if the eagle wants to fly, it can't because the dog is too heavy. So what do you do? What's the secret? What do you do? You starve the dog. Starve the dog, which is the flesh, and the eagle will fly, the spirit. Starve the dog. Discipline that dog in us. Our problem is in our culture and in our financial security, you know, we give anything, we give ourselves anything we want. I want to eat, I'm going to get a $20 plate, doesn't matter. I'm going to get a, you know, an appetizer and a salad and a marav she'e and all, because I can. Anything that my body wants, if I want a new sweater, I get a new sweater. If I want a new marav she'e, I get this. This is our life here. And so you've taught yourself or you've trained yourself to feed every desire that you have. And you don't know how to starve yourself. To starve the desires of the flesh. The flesh is also the ego. It's not the body only. The ego is part of your flesh. Okay? You got to starve the approval of others, that people would praise me and people would do this stuff. You got to starve that. You got to say, today, I don't care. I'm not going to take any compliments from people. I know I look pretty today, but I'm not going to let anybody compliment my hair. (laughs) Right? You have to do whatever it takes to starve the ego. And trust that the grace of the Holy Spirit is filling your life. And he will uproot those seeds and the appetites. Because he's going to give you a sense of that heavenly experience with God that you're going to say, I hate the things of the world. When you start to do this, I remember, so I used to listen to secular music when I was younger, when I was in high school. And I heard one Bible study, and from that day on, I think it's been like 15 years since I've listened to secular music, okay? But from that day on... Like, it was hard in the beginning. You know, I'd want to go to the radio. I'd want to do whatever. <laughs> and then, over time, when I heard it, it made me cringe. Because I realized how ungodly much of it is. How impure and how sexual and how violent and how... And I realized that all of a sudden, it became distasteful to me. Even though, a month ago, I was dying to turn on the radio or to switch the station or do whatever. I trained myself. I'm not saying I'm a saint, but what I'm trying to say is, there's grace that comes with these things, Okay? So I'm going to give you an equation, and we're going to end here, for your spiritual rule. The first thing is time. Okay? You have to give yourself a certain amount of time every day. Start small. And you want to grow it, right? You don't say, I'm going to pray for 12 hours today. You start with five minutes, okay? I'm going to consistently pray every day, even if I'm bleeding out of my eyes, for five minutes. Okay? No matter what happens, and I don't care how tired I am, what late shift I worked, five minutes. I don't care. I won't go to sleep. I won't put my head on the pillow without the five minutes. So time, and you've got to commit to the time, plus habits of holiness, which are praying Megbeah, reading the Bible, time in prayer, prostrations, taking communion in the week, fasting. Wednesdays and Fridays, I know this generation doesn't like it. (laughs) Right? We don't like it. Somebody bring back Pope Carolus to bring back the fish on Wednesdays and Fridays. Right? That's what people are saying. No. Believe me. Somebody told me this a long time ago and best advice I ever got. He said, every Wednesday, fast for your purity. Every Wednesday. 
I fast for my purity and I fast for the purity of my children. My own purity and the purity of my children. So my Wednesdays have a, pur- a, a purpose. So when I wake up in the morning and I'm starved, and I say, God is going to work purity in my life. Imagine for the next 18 years, I've been fasting this since my kids were just born. For like, I'm hoping that this fasting and this prayer for my kids is going to guard them from the evil of the world. And I'm hoping that they're going to learn how to guard themselves through fasting. Fasting is a good thing. It's like people all the time tell me, Abuna, you know, when they confess, they say, you know, I lie. I say, why do you lie? They say, because I'm afraid of consequences. Sometimes consequences are good. Like I tell young people, it's okay. If your parents take away your PlayStation for like a week, who cares? Like it's okay. Better than lying. Sometimes we need to just deal with the pain of fasting. It's a good thing. It's healthy because you're killing that old nature that, that's turning into a monster. You're feeding this sinful nature inside of you, this lion inside of you that can never be satisfied, and it's growing and growing and growing. Cut off his food for one day in the week. If you don't fast Wednesdays and Fridays, let's start with one day. Wednesdays. I know you guys go out on Friday nights. So Wednesdays. We'll start with Wednesdays. <laughs> Come on. I was born. I grew up here. I know what I was like. <laughs> I used to have a life. So then <laughs> Wednesdays, <laughs> Wednesdays, at least, I'm telling you at least, I'm not saying don't fast Wednesdays and Fridays, you YouTuber people that are ready to criticize me. <laughs> Wednesdays and Fridays we should fast. But if you won't do it, I'm telling you start with Wednesday. And if you can't even do that, start with just abstaining till 10 a.m. Before you eat your fatari food, okay? I'm saying at least, at least, <laughs> say okay, I'm going to at least abstain until 10 a.m. And then I'll slowly work my way over to to this point. Because I need it. I need it. It's important. It's this reminder of saying, I'm going to kill that. I'm going to starve the dog. Time plus habits of holiness plus godly encouragement. This generation, for some reason, is afraid to talk about spiritual things with their own friends. I don't know what it is. It's stupid. I'm just going to be frank. It's stupid. We need godly encouragement. You need to change your environment. If you know that your environment is the source of your sin, you need to surround yourselves with godly people. Maybe it's the people from your churches in this room that, have, that are all hearing the same message and are maybe contemplating trying to make these decisions. That we need godly encouragement, getting together to pray. Have you ever prayed with your friends? Do you ever get together and say, guys, let's pray. For some of us, it's like, I wouldn't dare say that to my friends. Why not? What kind of stupid things is that to say that I would never pray with my friends? Asanahna, we don't, uh, that stuff is junk. You need to pray with your friends. Read the Bible with your friends. Build up, there's no better intimacy that you can share with people. There's no better intimacy that you can share with people than spiritual intimacy. People that I've built friendships with that I see once every three years, we have the greatest bonds because of the spiritual fellowship that we shared for a month on a missionary trip or at a week somewhere on a retreat or whatever it is. And we're lifelong friends because of that spiritual bond. Not because of the stupid things that we did. Or it's the spiritual bond that, that, that godly en- encouragement changes your environment. You need to change your environment. That's important. That's important. I remember... When I was in Kenya, so we used to have, like, you know, the Kenyans would always come over to our place and hang out. And one day I was Skyping with my parents, and, and the, the guy that was at our house, he said something to me in Swahili, and I responded back to him in Swahili. My parents were like, what are you doing? I didn't realize. And they said, oh, you, you spoke Swahili. And I said, oh, yeah. I mean, I've been here for seven months now. Like, sooner or later, you're going to pick up some of the language. Because I've changed my environment. I didn't try to learn Swahili. Because I changed my environment... I began to speak Swahili. This is the, what we need to do is we need to change our environment, put ourselves in the environment that we want to be, that we want to be like. First thing is time plus habits of holiness plus godly encouragement equals spiritual growth. And you can put your own spiritual diet, however you want to put it, You have a place in your little books. You can go, and you're going to say, I am willing to abstain till 
7 a.m. <laughs> I'm joking. Don't do 7 a.m. Chaliko <laughs> Gadain. Okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to discipline myself. I'm going to fast this much. I'm going to commit to 5 minutes or 10 minutes. Or if, I can do fi- if I'm already doing 15 minutes, let me do 20 minutes. If I'm doing 20 minutes, let me do 30 minutes. If I'm doing 30 minutes, let me add another 30 minutes later on in the evening. And what you do is you work around it. Somebody says, hey, let's hang out tonight. Say, okay, um, I usually pray at 6 p.m., so then can we meet at 6.30? Everything works around this because this is very important because if there's a leak of the grace, it's dangerous. And the devil, when he finds the hole, he's going to plant more seeds. I have no walls. Don't let him bring down the walls. Those walls are the prayers and all these habits of holiness that I was talking about. We're going to stand up and pray. And then you're going to go and come up with your own spiritual rule. Share it with your father of confession. Say, Abuna, I want you to hold me accountable to this. I'm going to, this is what I recommend to people in the beginning. At least three psalms of the Agbeya a day. Three psalms. Just start with three psalms. With three matanias. One for yourself. One for yourself. One for those you love, and one for the world. I'm asking the Christians to do their part and say, I'm going to do a matanya for my own self. I'm doing a matanya for those that I love, that God would have mercy on them, and God would be with them. It's the prayer that answers all prayer. Okay? It's the prayer that it, it covers all prayer. I'm praying for friends and family. Maybe you have certain ma- people in your mind. And the third one would be for the world, for the whole world, that the world would know Christ. This is my recommendation. You can do whatever you want. Three matanias. And the way we do matanya is we do our hands like a fist. And we make a cross with our thumb. And we go down. And we put our head to the floor. And we say a Jesus prayer. My Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. My Lord Jesus Christ, give me the purity of Joseph. My Lord Jesus Christ, sanctify my heart. My Lord Jesus Christ, uproot the bad seeds. My Lord Jesus Christ, give me victory over my lust. My Lord Jesus Christ, give me security in you. My Lord, start with the name of Jesus, because the name of Jesus, you invoke the presence of Christ immediately in your presence, and it's powerful. The name of Jesus, when you read Psalm 117 in the Agbeya, it talks about, you know, they surrounded me like bees, and in the name of the Lord, I cut them off. And, then, and he goes on and talks about all the victories they had by in the name of the Lord. The bees are the thoughts. When he says, I was surrounded by bees, it's those thoughts that are buzzing around me. And in the name of the Lord, I cut them off. The evil thoughts that are fighting your mind every day. Okay? Are we okay with the spiritual rule? You're like, well, that's for the monks. The monks are just people that they do a higher spiritual rule because they realize they're in more danger because they're in the devil's territory. So are we. We're in the world. The world is nasty. You see it every day. Look at the news. Look at what's going on in politics. Look at, every, look at what's happening. This is a nasty world. If you're not guarding yourself, you're going to become like the world. Sanctify your own mind and your heart. Change your appetite to become spiritual. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Stand up and pray. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come before you, each and every one of us, asking you, Lord, to give us your Holy Spirit to build the walls around Jerusalem, to build walls around our heart that, that the enemy would not be able to penetrate and try to, to enter and to plant evil seeds of, of sin, and bring us into bondage and to entrench sin into our heart. We ask you, O Lord, that you would give us your Holy Spirit to uproot any sins that have been deeply planted in our heart, Lord. You know, Lord, that those seeds are bringing forth like different sins and different weaknesses and sin is leading to sin, Lord. And We no longer want to be in bondage, Lord, and so we're asking that you would use our spiritual rule as the tool, Lord, to uproot all those insecurities and all those sinful things, Lord. We're asking you, O Lord, to give us a greater capacity to pray, that we can tolerate more and we can do more and we would measure our growth by 
the amount of time that we desire to spend with you, Lord. Grant that we would say with St. Paul that we bring our bodies into subjection, lest by saving others I myself become disqualified. Grant, O Lord, that you would give me the grace. We ask, O Lord, that you would give us your Son, Jesus Christ, to dwell in our hearts. Because we know when he's dwelling there, Lord, no sin can, can be there, Lord. And when sin comes, Lord, let your grace abound. I pray for all my brothers and sisters, Lord, that you would give us victory over our passions, over our sinfulness, Lord, over our, our sinful appetites, Lord, and give us, make us more aware, Lord, of the lusts of the Spirit. We love you, Lord, and we ask that you would draw us closer and closer to you, that you would fill, Lord, the God-shaped holes in each and every one of us, Lord, that we would no longer run to fill ourselves, Lord, with the things of the world, but we would long to be filled with you. We thank you, Lord, for these last couple of days. Lord, we ask that you bless the rest of our retreat and you be with us. We pray this in your holy and precious name through the presence of the Holy Virgin Mary, the prayers of St. Mark, all the saints who have pleased since the beginning. Make us, Lord, worthy to pray thankfully, our Father who art in heaven. So I think we have one last quiet time, correct? Teachers in the back? Yes, so take your books, go, write your own spiritual rule, and bring it to your father confession that he can hold you accountable to that. <laughs> <laughs>